Executive Director, David Markland. Executive Producer, Gary Baker. Producer, Claire Dunlap. And Creative Director, Rick West. Hey everyone, another full house at the end of Midsummer Screen for Halloween Horror Nights. You know, I was reminded yesterday that this is definitely a Halloween and horror crowd because we had fire alarms going off for an hour and everybody was like, eh. <laughs> um, I, I'm out here, uh, this is when we kind of come out and give some thanks to different people and want to make sure we, there's just so many people to thank on this show. Um, we have the greatest crew imaginable, the most friendly crew who come in, you know, they work together uh, once a year usually on this one event uh, and make something amazing. So if you've seen anybody out there from Emily uh, at check-in, uh, handing out wristbands to get ready in as quickly as possible to the white bats on the show floor, and Richard and Justin and uh, Cr uh, Chris and Ian with their tech crew and cameras in the Hall of Shadows. It's, it's just a group of people that love Halloween as much as you do and they really dedicate their time to make this event as, as good as possible and as good of an experience for you because you guys are like us. We just want to have a great time with Halloween. So if you ever see them, please thank them. Uh, but you're just being here is also a big thanks. Um, that's my spiel right now, but we're going to get to that, but I also do want to give a special thanks to my awesome co-founders of the event here, starting back there, Rick West, who puts together the Hall of Shadows every year and makes an amazing experience. Claire Dunlap does every year. She steps up and does more and more to make this event stronger and stronger all over the place. Gary is responsible for this stage. I mean, and, and he's going to talk more about his team, but I just want to make sure that you know he does this. This is stuff that he have, has like in the back closet of his apartment or his house. And he just was like, what do we got this year? So I'm passing it off to Gary. Thanks, Dave. Uh, uh, I just want to thank uh, my business partner, Jim Call, and my godson, Anthony Call. They are the techs that keep everything running in here. This, this is our seventh year here, and we have seven stages operating, and uh, they keep everything running smooth along with the rest of the tech crew. So, just want to say thank you all for coming. You are now a part of our Haunt family, as you've been from year one, and we're so appreciative that you're here. So, thank you so much again, and I hope you will have a great time on the next panel, which is John Murdy's, and we're already working on next year, so... Uh, what are the dates for next year? Look at how many people, I love it. Hi everyone, welcome. So stoked to see all of your faces. It's been so awesome to have all of you guys here this weekend and we have just had such a blast. Um, I'm not gonna talk about yesterday at all, but uh, we appreciate it if you came back today. Thank you so much. And uh, I just wanted to do a shout out to, you know, all of you coming here, shopping, participating, doing the immersive, you are supporting small business and that is a big thing that we do here at Midsummer Scream, all of our vendors. You know, it's their livelihood, and they get excited to be here and to see their friends and to sell their wares and to share their creativity. And you guys are the lifeblood of that as well. So thank you for being here. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for supporting for so many years. We appreciate it. So in 2016, made a verbal contract with you, so I just got to check in. Long Beach, have we done you proud? Perfect. Thank you guys so much for spending your weekend with us. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and to see everybody this weekend. And uh, I got a shout out to all the haunters in the Hall of Shadows. What do you guys think? 
thank all of them. Such a great job that everybody did. Also have to shout out to Emmanuel Menjvar. He's the one that does all the recorded intros that you've been hearing all weekend. So Menji, shout out to you. Thank you, my friend. Are you all exhausted? We're here at the finish line. Are you tired? Your legs are exploding. You, you've spent all your money on the vending show floor and were wrecked from playing the fire alarm drinking game yesterday. So, <laughs> wonderful. You guys ready for some Halloween Horror Night? Are we going to see you next year? Happy Halloween, everybody. of this presentation is allowed. We do ask that your camera or streaming device remain at or below shoulder level, not blocking the view of anyone behind you. Thank you for your cooperation and for being considerate of those around you. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Midsummer Scream. Each year, our little spook show draws visitors from all over for a weekend of haunts and horror. And one visitor in particular comes an extra long way to be with all of you, proving that this community truly is universal. Bringing the evil from the Emerald Isle, please welcome to the stage the one, the only creative director and executive producer of Universal Studios Hollywood's Halloween Horror Nights, John Murdy. I'm going to chant all of your names. Just yell them all out. <laughs> How you guys doing today? I'm John Birdie. I'm the creative director, executive producer of Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios Hollywood. Welcome back to Midsummer Scream. We got a lot of stuff to show you guys today, but you guys know how this starts, right? Well, no, actually it starts like this, okay? Thank you. That's a tradition, you gotta be, no, seriously, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's the fans of Halloween Horror Nights that fuel our passion for the event, that make our, ourselves and our team want to top them, you know, top ourselves every single year. Uh, we appreciate all that as support, so thank you so much. And do we have in the house, do we have any, Team members from Halloween Horror Nights, anybody? Stand up, stand up, stand up. It takes a village to do this event. It's not me, it's all of these people who work on this event, all the men and women who work on this event, year after year after year. It's their passion too, give it up for them. All right. What should we do? <laughs> By the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. You guys ready for an announcement right out of the gate here? What you're thinking. Has Texas Chainsaw Massacre ever been featured at Halloween Horror Nights in the past? Yes, it has. What we're going to take you through today, and I'm going to do a deep dive into Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the legacy of Leatherface. This is an all new experience. I'm going to show you why. But first, a short history lesson. 
So, Texas Chainsaw Massacre goes all the way back to the very beginning of our era of Halloween Horror Nights. It was one of the first intellectual properties that we featured at our event. In 2007, we did Texas Chainsaw Massacre back in business. Anybody see this? Anybody in the crowd around back then? A lot of you who saw that original house said it was the scariest house that we ever produced. Is that true? Okay, so that's the bar. Right? That's the bar. We knew we had to top ourselves. But we did it in 2007. It actually wasn't based on the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It was based on the 2003 remake. So in 2008, we did the exact same thing. Because <laughs> we did that back then. You know, back when I first started doing Halloween Horror Nights, I came from Universal Creative, from doing like rides like Revenge of the Mummy. And then when we took on... It's, it celebrates its 20th anniversary this year. But then when we... When we took on Halloween Horror Nights, you know, the first years that we were doing it, we were like, oh, cool, everybody liked that, let's just do it again. So in 2008, we did Texas Chainsaw Massacre back in business, exact same house, and then four years went by. And then in 2012, we did Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Saw is the Law. That's the first house we did based on the original 1974 classic film. Quick personal story. You see the scene, what's the scene? <laughs> Yeah, the dining room, the dinner table scene. That particular year, I brought my uh, father-in-law and my mother-in-law from Ireland to Halloween Horror Nights for the first time. When we got to the scene, the path goes around to the left. My father-in-law, he'd never been in a haunted house, he went around to the right and he sat down in that bone chair and he just started chatting up Grandpa. <laughs> and the poor performer's like, what the hell's going on? And then Leatherface came running into the room with a chainsaw and my mother-in-law tried to smack him. And I'm like, no, no, you can't do this. But in 2012, that's the first time we did the original Chainsaw Massacre. And then 2016, four years later, do you see the trend starting to develop here? For all you conspiracy theorists in the house. We did Texas Chainsaw Massacre Blood Brothers. And this was different. We took, the idea was we took the first film and the second film and we created our own sequel that lived between the first film and the second film. And to this day, this house holds the record for being the only haunted house ever in the history of America that prominently featured a president, Gerald Ford, in the opening scene. <laughs> And then in 2017, we did Titans of Terror, where we mashed up Leatherface, Freddy, and Jason. And then four years later, <laughs> in 2021, we went back to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that this is all new, this is all different. Why did we decide to do Texas Chainsaw Massacre in 2024? <laughs> this is why. In 2024, it is the 50th anniversary of this historic franchise. How many of you guys love Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Okay, if I was going to make a Mount Rushmore for horror, which somebody should do, <laughs> maybe one of you one day will do this, I would put Leatherface for sure as one of the four heads on the Mount Rushmore of horror. That's what this franchise means to the whole genre of horror. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of that historic franchise. So the people that we've always dealt with over the years on Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they came to me and they pitched me this idea. Nice. <laughs> Tomorrow we're gonna sue somebody. This is what they said. They said, why don't you take a multiverse approach to this classic franchise, right? And I went, yes, let's do that, that's awesome. Let's do a multiverse approach. And then I panicked. Because <laughs> I had no idea how to do that. So what did I do? I do what I always do. I went back to the film, even though I've seen it a million times, I started researching the film. And this particular line was the seed for everything I'm gonna show you right now. There, you know the scene, right? It's an idyllic summer afternoon. There's a group of teenagers driving in a van. They're driving through Muerto County, Texas. And they see this dude in the distance waving and jumping up and down. And they decide, well, you should never do in a horror movie. Don't ever do this in real life. They decided, oh, look at that crazy guy. Let's let him in our car. Let's give him a ride. And he says these lines, my family has always been in meat. 
What's he talking about? The slaughterhouse. He says, oh, there is, you know, I used to work at the slaughterhouse, and my brother did, and my grandpa. And I thought to myself, you never see that in the original film. They talk about the slaughterhouse, but you never see it. So what we decided to do was to create an alternate timeline. This is where it gets real heavy, okay? So follow me. We decided to create an alternate timeline that runs parallel to the events in the 1974 film, but that takes place entirely at this location you've never been to, the slaughterhouse. Because if I know the Sawyer family from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which I do, I know that if there's a slaughterhouse that they all used to work at that's been sitting there abandoned, they're probably doing something with it, right? So that meant, in research, I needed to learn everything I possibly could about slaughterhouses and meat production. So that was the next phase of my research. I don't recommend this, by the way. <laughs> this messed me up. I spent hours and hours and hours researching slaughterhouses. In fact, this is the first treatment I've ever written that I had to put a disclaimer on the cover page, you know, like a warning to any of our team members that were going to read this. And if all of you who work at Halloween Horror Nights are here, you know I'm telling the truth, right? Right on the front page, big, huge letters. In fact, most of my research imagery I can't even show you. I didn't put it in the deck because it's really, really, really awful. <laughs> so now it's time for a slightly longer history lesson than the one we had before. Um, it starts with this date, December 25th, 1865. Does anybody have any idea what that date has to do with anything besides the fact that it's Christmas? This happened. The Union Stockyard in Chicago opened its doors for the first time. So back before there was this place, um, people like slaughtered their animals on the farm, right? Everything was done locally. But in 1865, they opened this place, the Chicago Stockyards, and they had a bunch of trains that came to the same point. So they were able to bring all these cattle and pigs in, and then after a little bit of time, originally it was just a cattle mart, but then this gentleman with the crazy sideburns came along. This is Philip Danforth Armour, and what he was the creator or innovator of was the assembly line. In fact, before Henry Ford ever built an automobile, he got the idea from this dude. Philip Danforth Armour, do you recognize the name? Anybody as old as me in the house? <laughs> hot dogs, Armour hot dogs. Do you remember that commercial? We saw this commercial constantly when we were kids. This guy built the first mechanized meat processing plant at the Chicago stockyards, and he created what is known as the disassembly line. So the animals go in, and then piece by piece by piece by piece by piece by piece, they get disassembled, right? Now, Philip Danforth Armour was famous for this quote. He said that he used everything but the squeal. And this is just some of the stuff that they made out of everything that went into the slaughterhouse, everything from chewing gum to chess pieces. But like all great industrialists, he had a rival, this gentleman, Gustavus Franklin Swift. He built a slaughterhouse and a meat processing plant right next to Armour's plant, but he had another idea. He was the inventor of the ice-cooled rail car. So now they could use the railroad to transport meat all over the country, and that changed everything. This is from the 1940s. This is the same place. Now it's huge. World War II is going on. They need to feed all these soldiers. Uh, it fueled America's obsession with meat, because back in the days before this, it was really rare that you ate meat for dinner, right? That would be like a, a treat. But because they had the refrigerated train cars, they could transport meat all over the country. And you can even see the propaganda posters from World War II. They were like, meat, it's the meal for a healthy defense. Now this, of course, led to what it always leads to in these situations, environmental disaster. So that first picture on the left, uh, that's what they called the backyards of the Chicago uh, stockyards. This is where all the employees lived, and that's what they lived in. Industrial waste, basically. The other picture where you see that guy standing in the middle of the river, that's the Chicago River. They pumped 50,000 gallons of wastewater from the slaughterhouse into the river every single day, and it turned into what they called Bubbly Creek. All the noxious fumes in there, they all bubbled to the surface so that the creek was constantly bubbling, and there was so much sludge on the surface of the creek that you could literally stand on it. 
Now, after this, you know, environmentalists like Upton Sinclair, who wrote the famous book, The Jungle, he started criticizing everything that was going on and brought a lot of attention to it. And shortly after that, after World War II, the freeways were built. They changed from a refrigerated rail cars to refrigerated trucks that could transport the meat around. It no longer became necessary to have a slaughterhouse in a big city like Chicago, right? So eventually that led to decline. And by the early 70s, this place was gone. It was completely demolished. And people started building slaughterhouses way off the beaten path, away from big cities, in rural places, like Muerto County, Texas. And this is where it beautifully dovetails into the events of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Do you know this date, August 18th, 1973? <laughs> That's the beginning of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's the day it takes place on. So what we decided to do was to take everything I just showed you and apply that to Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This is the key art for the attraction. Here's your social media moment to take that, put it on the internet and say you were first. <laughs> um, I had to come up with a way to tell this backstory, right? So I wrote a script for Nubbin Sawyer, also sometimes referred to as the hitchhiker. I didn't voice it, but I'm gonna do it for you so you get the idea. This is how we're gonna set up the experience. Do you guys like when we have a live character out in front of the facade? Well, it's not Nubbins, but I'll show you what it is in a second. But you hear his voice while you're waiting in line, and he says this. My family's always been in meat. We used to work at the slaughterhouse. All us Sawyers, me, my brothers, grandpa too. He was the best killer that ever there was. But the place got shut down on account of them government contracts drying up after the wars. We was destitute. But you can always find meat if in you know where to look. Animals hitting the road by them trucks passing through? Sick ones farmers put down. But when they moved the main road, meat got harder to find. My brothers and I tried digging some up from the graveyard, but the people wasn't dying fast enough. Like I said, my family's always been in meat. And if there's meat to be had, us Sawyers will find it. I think I just ripped off, like, you know, Chop Top. <laughs> I think I switched from, like, the hitchhiker to Chop Top halfway through. But thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so this is the facade. The facade is the abandoned slaughterhouse. It's been sitting empty for a couple of decades, ever since the contracts dried up after World War II, Korea. It closed. It was surrounded by fences. But the Sawyers took it back over again. Why? Because they can conceal all the things they're doing from the authorities. So while you're waiting in line, getting ready to enter the slaughterhouse, you're hearing that voiceover that I was just doing, and then this guy walks in. This is Leatherface from a 2017 film called Leatherface, a prequel. He's got a big cow head over his own, and that's what we're doing with this house. We are gonna do every iteration of Leatherface <laughs> from all nine films in the franchise. We're bringing them all together. So he comes out, and he's looking at you, and he's sizing you up. And then he starts kind of gesturing to you with one hand. And then he turns around, and you see on the back, he's got the words, follow, written in blood. And then he walks back through the steel door that he came through, and you have to follow him. Now, one of the creative challenges of this was, okay, so we're gonna take all these different iterations of Leatherface, and we're gonna have them in one house. But how is that gonna make sense? So again, I went back to the original 1974 film. Do you guys know Gunnar Hassan who played Leatherface? Well, I read a bunch of interviews with him, and when he was doing the original role, he described Leatherface in this way. He said he has no personality of his own, and that's why he has to wear the different skin faces, the masks. And he wears different masks depending on what he's doing. So if you think of the original film, he wears the killing mask when he's out chasing people, when he's hunting. 
He wears the pretty lady mask with the makeup when it's the formal occasion, like the dining room scene. And he wears the old grandma mask, the old lady mask, when he's stuck in the kitchen with the old man washing dishes. He just takes on a different mask for whatever job he's doing. So it occurred to me, that's what we're gonna do with this house. All these different iterations of Leatherface are gonna represent all the different jobs that you would do in a slaughterhouse. So I studied slaughterhouses, you know, endlessly and looked at all the different steps of the disassembly line, all the different roles that you would need and assigned different roles to different leather faces and the members of the Sawyer family. But the first thing you're gonna see when you step through the front door is Leatherface's collection of skinned faces. And then you're gonna go into the holding pen because that would always be the first room in a slaughterhouse. It's where you gather all the animals together. In this case, it's where you gather all the humans together. And the first, uh, the next character of Leatherface you're gonna see is the classic 1974 killing mask, chainsawing through a door, busting into the room, and chasing you on into the animal shoots. And this is real slaughterhouse. This is like the, one of the few pictures I could actually show you from my research. Um, you notice how there, there's all these like twists and turns? That was done intentionally in slaughterhouses. They found out really early on if it was just a straight line, the animals would go and then would stop. And then they wouldn't go any further. So that's why there's always twists because you don't know what's coming around the corner, right? Occurred to me it's the exact same philosophy with building haunted houses. <laughs> We've been doing this for years. We always are like, let's have lots of twists and turns. It's like an animal pen because you don't know what's coming around the corner. But in this case, what's coming around the corner is what they called in the slaughterhouses the prodder and the stunner. And in this case, the prodder is chopped up. He's just back from Vietnam, he's still got his army jacket on, he's going to have a cattle prod and he's going to be prodding you to the stunner, which in this case is going to be Leatherface from the 2003 remake. He's up on a platform, he's got a big sledgehammer, so Chop Top setting him up, Leatherface is knocking him down. That takes you to the next room we call the killing floor. Um, and this is another weird thing I came across in my research. This is actually a postcard that people bought. <laughs> from the Chicago stockyards. Believe it or not, this place was a tourist attraction. It was like the first theme park. Thousands and thousands of people went there to get guided tours every day of the slaughterhouse. It sounds insane, like who would do that today? But this one guy um, invented something called the Hereford Wheel, which is a way to get the animals up into the air and onto the disassembly line, so we decided to build our own. But we also have this giant mound of corpses when you come in, and seated on top of the corpses is Grandpa on his bone throne. In the original film, they talk about how great he was, how he could kill all these, you know, cattle, and you know, and they would he could have killed more if the hook and pull guys could get the beeves out of the way. So this is our cast, us from the killing room. Um, you have Grandpa. He's up on his bone throne. He's whacking Bunny Foo Foo on the head with a mallet. Well, it's not a bunny, so you don't worry. It's a human, that makes it okay. <laughs> Down below is, uh, is Dumbins, or the hitchhiker, prodding him on, and then Leatherface in this scene is batting cleanup, and he's gonna be in the Pretty Woman mask from the 1974 film. And then that takes you, to, I can't even show you these pictures, they're so disgusting, but they had these huge boiling vats in slaughterhouses, and that was to, to boil the animals to make the hair and skin more pliable so they could be removed. So we thought, well, the Sawyers aren't that high tech, right? So they wouldn't have huge boiling vats. They just take, you know, steel drums, you know, light a, light a fire underneath, pop a corpse in it, call it a day. So in this scene, um, we meet the domestics. So it's the old man on one side and Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the next generation, this weird version of the old woman mask that exists in that film. And the old man is yelling at Leatherface, Leatherface, stop gacking at them girls. Them beefs needs turning. And they're on either sides of you. You're in the middle. They both have paddles they want to whack you with. And they drive you into the skinning room. Now this is always a classic scene we like to do with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We call it the face peel. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? So in this scene, we take Leatherface from the 2006 
prequel to the remake, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning, where he's wearing that weird leather mask. He's got a meat cleaver in one hand, and he is chopping a, a guy we just refer to as the meat. <laughs> he's chopping his legs into mincemeat, and he's taking a, a skinning knife, and he's cutting along his chin line and slowly peeling his face off. Then we take you into a transition that we simply call the hallway of horrors, where you have to walk through skinned bodies. And when I say you have to walk through skinned bodies, I don't mean bodies with their skin removed. I mean the skin itself. <laughs> you have to walk through their skin. And there's a surprise waiting for you at the end. And I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Because this is something new. We invented just for this house. And I think we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Another role in the slaughterhouse, and it was always described as the worst job, is what they called the squeegee men. So one guy would have a hose, the other guy would have a broom, and they would just sweep the, the, the everything on the floor, okay? And I should mention when they had the Chicago stockyards, when they were building them and they had the original armor plant and the swift plant, there were no bathrooms. Employees were just expected to go wherever they could. So these guys had to sweep all that up and push it down the drains and then it would be dumped into the river. So we decided for our scene, that terrible job would be assigned to Chop Top, because he's always pissed about something. And Chop Top is going to be screaming at his brother Leatherface, Leatherface, you idiot! You gummed up the works again! Get down here and tame out the screen trap! Um, this is a water scene. You've seen our water scenes, right? So, Gook is pouring in through these big drains, filling up the floor with not really water. It's kind of like stew. It's like got body parts in it, and it's thick, and it's bubbling, and it's oozing, and it smells delightful. Did you guys think Exorcist smelled bad last year? <laughs> I apologize in advance for the factory sensation you are all going to experience. And, I don't know, you're cheering. <laughs> you're like, yes! We love bad smells. Um, Chop Top is pushing an old cart that he's got a collection of just slop and blech stuff that he's been picking up off the slaughterhouse floor and dumping into the water and trying to get it to go down the drains. We call it the Nubbins cart because it's a special effect. Um, do you know Nubbins, his little corpse puppet that he carries around in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2? You know, there's a surprise with him. We'll have to wait to see it when you go. Um, but while Chop Top is screaming, Leatherface comes into the scene to chase you out of the room and out of the slaughterhouse altogether, and that's going to be Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Now at this point, you're outside. You're on the loading dock. You've left the you've finally gotten out of the slaughterhouse. And this is where the research comes back into play. Remember I was talking about refrigerated train cars that had ice that kept the meat cool? Yeah, we'll see the Sawyer family they're not too handy, they're not too good with technology, they're not too mechanically inclined. Um, so there's a generator, it's this horrible rigged together generator that they've used to keep the lights on, but just barely. Um, but they never really got around to figuring out this refrigerated train car, okay? Now you know you're gonna have to go in there, right? You don't wanna go in there, trust me but there's gonna be somebody to make sure you go in there, and that's gonna be Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Now he roars up with his chainsaw, drives you inside the refrigerated train car, and this is Texas, right? All of these carcasses have just been sitting there for a long time in the hot Texas sun. They're not frozen anymore. <laughs> They've all defrosted, they're kinda of sickly looking, kind of wet looking, there's maggots all over them, there's flies buzzing around. You gotta walk through that. <laughs> and just to make sure you do, we have Leatherface from the most recent version of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the 2022 film, to drive you on your way. Now when you get out of the refrigerated train car, you're outside, you're in the woods. You're heading to this weird looking graveyard, but it's not the graveyard from the original film. 
It's the Sawyer family graveyard for all the members of the Sawyer family who lived, worked, and died in this slaughterhouse. Because safety wasn't a big deal when these places were run back in the old days. So a whole lot of them lost limbs, lost arms, or just flat out died. They drug them outside, they hammered a couple of boards together, wrote their name, Bubba, Zedekiah, Malachi, stuck it in the ground and buried them. But then they, you know, it's the Sawyer family, they're weird. So um, they, one night they went down to the local like butcher shop in town and they stole one of those pig statues that always used to be in front of butcher shops. They usually had a pig and he was dressed like a chef. And they hauled that back to the slaughterhouse and they set it up like a religious statue because to the Sawyers, meat is their god. So it's this weird, freaky cemetery. You're hearing a chainsaw in the distance. You're hearing a woman screaming. You're thinking you might recognize that from an earlier film. Um, but before you get to process that too much, Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3D comes out and drives you on your way. And this is where the story, I said we're doing a parallel story, alternate timeline, but a parallel to the events of the original 1974 film. And here's where it connects. All of a sudden you find yourself approaching the Sawyer House from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. There's a radio on inside the house somewhere playing music. And then suddenly you hear a news report come on. Grave robbing in the state of Texas is tonight's top story and someone changes the channel. And then out of the darkness, out of the woods around you, Leatherface, the pretty woman look again from the 1974 film, comes racing at you, drives you inside, and now you're heading towards that classic steel door from the original film, right back to the first murder that happens in the film. So all these things have been happening, were happening right before then, and now you're confronted with Leatherface and the steel door, and I think we'll leave it there. You know, hey, how many of you guys, like, how many of you guys love this particular film, the original 1974, Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Yeah. It is, it's, like I said, it's one of the most classic films, and not only the entire genre of horror, but it's, it's, you know, it's a classic film full stop, right? And you look at this scene, right? This is the classic sunset dance scene at the end of the movie where he's just, you know, doing his thing with his chainsaw, and you, it's such an icon of horror that we forget what it looked like when they were making it. That's what it looked like. These were a bunch of, you know, former students, not in Hollywood, you know, out in Texas, making this movie, low budget horror, with their friends in like 100 degree heat, working crazy hours, and this group of people made something that's lasted this long. I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah, and in particular, these two gentlemen. Kim Henkel, who wrote, co-wrote Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and that gentleman with the beard, Toby Hooper. Give it up for Toby Hooper. Toby Hooper co-wrote and was the director of Chainsaw Massacre. And Toby Hooper, in so many ways, was my entree into horror. When I was a little kid, staying up, when my parents thought I was asleep, watching Salem's Lot, the first time it was aired on TV, you know, and being terrified, that was Toby Hooper. Toby made that. First horror movie I ever went to in a theater, Poltergeist. Toby Hooper, right? Toby made some of the most iconic horror movies ever in the genre of horror. And one thing about Toby is, you know, people always ask me, like, when did you know Horror Nights in Hollywood when we guys, you know, when we brought it back in 2006, when it was here to stay? That's the moment, right there. The one day all of a sudden, Toby Hooper showed up and he was in our house and that's him taking pictures of Leatherface. I have all these pictures of him going through the house. He's like a filmmaker. He's down low, taking shots, he's up high. Um, I've had that moment so many times since then, whether it was William Freakin, you know, calling me up the first time we did The Exorcist, the director of that movie and going, I heard you did something with my film. <laughs> I would very much like to see that. And having him come down on an afternoon and taking him through the house and spending an hour and a half talking to him about The Exorcist, or John Landis when we were doing you know, American World from London, or you know, Gilmer Del Toro with Crimson Peak, or you know, Jordan Peele, on and on and on. I've gotten to do that a lot. 
This is the first time I ever saw somebody who made the movie that we were featuring attend our event. I've always been grateful to Toby for that. So as an extra Easter egg to pay tribute to these great gentlemen who created this iconic horror franchise, we have named our slaughterhouse the Hooper and Henkel Meat Processing. And that's, that's for Toby and Kim. Of course, the Sawyers, you know, graffitied it with Sawyer Meats, because that's what they do. Um, but, you know, Chris and I, and I should give it up for Chris Williams, my longtime art director, production designer, my partner in everything calling it Horror Nights. All of these elevations, that's the work that Chris and his art department, Brandy Creason, um, all of them that work on this event year after year after year, um, that's their work, but um, I know Chris and I sat down and we went, all right, let's try to top the, you know, what we did the first time with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Let's try to create the scariest, freakiest place you don't ever want to go in <laughs> house. Um, and that's what we've tried to do. So I hope you guys are ready for it. Are you ready for it? All right. Are there any Universal Monster fans in the house? Okay, you know, just the other day we announced a brand new house that continues the Universal Monsters legacy at Halloween Horror Nights. Started in 2018 with Universal Monsters. This is the sixth that we have done at Universal Studios Hollywood, and this one is called Universal Monsters Eternal Bloodlines. So what's different about this house? Um, this is the first time we've ever done a completely female-centric take on the Universal Monsters using characters that are um, rooted in our film history, except one which we invented, which I'll tell you about in just a second, um, but bringing these characters to light that maybe are lesser known than some of our you know, standard characters that everybody knows. Um, we did this in collaboration with our colleagues in Universal Orlando, so Chris and I worked with their team to create this original story. So this is a completely original story, um, and I'm gonna show you the monsters. So let's meet the monsters. Let's start with the heroines. Saskia von Helsing. This is a completely original character. It doesn't exist in the novel, doesn't exist in the films. And I should give credit to the great Crash McCreary. Do you guys know Crash? Legendary creature creator. He works with us on the Universal Monsters franchise. He does all the key art for the posters. He drew this gorgeous picture of Saskia von Helsing. Uh, Crash has been in the movie industry. He started with like um, Stan Winston back in the Terminator days. Worked on Terminator. He helped you know design Edward Scissorhands, the Jurassic Park films, you know Pirates of the Caribbean, on and on and on. But every year we get to work with Crash, and this is his artwork. Um, so Saskia is the last descendant of this guy. Abraham von Helsing, the famed monster hunter from our 1931 film Dracula. All of his other descendants, who are all male, have all died. They've all been killed by Dracula's daughter. Why? Because this dude killed her dad. <laughs> Do you remember the end of Dracula? He drives a stake through the heart of Dracula, and that's it. So Dracula's daughter, is on a vendetta to wipe out the Von Helsing family, and Saskia is the last one left. Now we've paired her with the Bride of Frankenstein, inspired by our 2021 house, The Bride of Frankenstein Lives. Do you remember that house? People have been saying, oh, you gotta bring her back, you gotta bring her back. We listen, we listen to you guys. I was like, we gotta bring the bride back. She's such a great character, such a great house. Uh, we've kind of taken, uh, and this is Crash's artwork again, and it's inspired by what Lucas Colshaw on our team drew for the monster hunter look from Bride of Frankenstein Lives. Um, and of course, she's inspired by our 1935 film, The Bride of Frankenstein, which she is in for exactly, what, five minutes, <laughs> right? It's so great that the bride has continued to live despite her entire film career being five minutes. Um, and then there's the villains. I mentioned this one. Dracula's Daughter, that comes from a real universal movie. It was 1936. The Countess Maria Zaleska, um, it was Dracula's Daughter. It was the first sequel they made to Dracula. Um, this is Crash's artwork for the mid-transformation look of Dracula's Daughter. 
And we, you know, we thought, okay, cool. Let's take that farther. So when she gets fully transformed, she looks like this. You guys cool if I share a sneak peek? Yeah. All right. A little makeup. Um, so this is Patrick McGee, McGee Effects, our longtime makeup artist. This is his sculpt for the mid-transform Dracula's daughter. And then we decided to bring, you know, a couple Easter eggs, a couple of little surprises from the past. Some I'll tell you about, some I won't. Um, we decided to bring one of Dracula's brides back. So this is the mask for Dracula's bride. She factors into the story. And then we decided to pair this character with two other female universal monsters, starting with the She-Wolf, inspired by our 1946 film, The She-Wolf of London. Has anybody ever seen, seriously, She-Wolf of London? Anybody? What's weird about that movie? Is there a werewolf in that movie? No. There's none. There is no werewolf in She-Wolf of London. It's kind of a gaslight story. They're trying to convince this woman that she's turning into the werewolf and killing all these people, but she isn't. It never happens. We took an artistic license with that, and we turned her into this. And this is artwork done by our very own Lucas Colshaw. And this is Patrick McGee's sculpt for the She-Wolf of London. All right, the last of the female monsters, Anksu Namun. Inspiration, our 1932 film, The Mummy. In that movie, uh, Imhotep, who gets reincarnated as Ardith Bay, uh, becomes obsessed with this woman named Helen, who's up on screen right now. Um, and he wants to take her and sacrifice her so he can turn her back into his long lost love, Anaksu Namun. Um, so he took that idea and we ran with it, and we created this. So this is the look of our female mummy in our experience. Uh, you recognize the amulet of Ra that she's wearing around her neck? That's a throwback to our 2022 house, Universal Monsters Legends Collide. That's what the mummy was wearing. Um, and then this is Patrick McGee's sculpt for Anksu Namun, and I love, I'm, I'm in love with this cute little cobra <laughs> that he sculpted, because that's part of her headband. So um, that is our monsters. Now they are joined together in what we call the Unholy Alliance. So Dracula's daughter is the most powerful one. You know, in the film, Dracula has the power of mind control. So he, uh, she is at the top of this pyramid, and then down below is Anaksum Numun and the She-Wolf of London. Dracula's daughter is controlling these characters in order to help her wipe out the Von Helsings. Now the story, I'm just gonna share a couple of pieces of artwork that Lucas created to help tell our story. Our story starts in Amsterdam. Why? Because that's where the Von Helsing family is from in the original novel. It starts at a funeral. Um, the last male descendant of Abraham Von Helsing has just died at the hands of Dracula's daughter. Uh, Saskia Von Helsing is at the funeral. She's mourning the death of her brother. Um, there's still a few mourners that are hanging around, but it's really cold, it's snowing. Um, but in the distance, you can see in this image on the right-hand side, I think that's on your right, yes, um, is one of the vampire brides from our Bride of Frankenstein Lives house. She's been sent by Dracula's daughter as an assassin to take out Saskia at the funeral. Just take care of them all at once. But someone else has showed up, an unexpected guest, and that's the Bride of Frankenstein. You can see her hiding off to the left side of the image. She has followed Dracula's Bride to this location. Why? Because that's what she was doing in our 2021 house. She was hunting Dracula's Brides. So it just happens to converge on this day, at this moment, where the Bride of Frankenstein is there to kill Dracula's Bride, and Dracula's Bride is trying to kill Saskia von Helsing, so it causes them to form an unlikely alliance between monster hunter and monster. So together they travel to the source. If you're gonna to go to the source, you have to go to Transylvania. That's where Castle Dracula is. Um, particularly an area that's mentioned in the book and the movie called the Borgo Pass. We've added our own touches to this. Little Vad the Impaler influence of all these impaled corpses. Um, they're getting out of the black coach and they're getting ready to go to Dracula's castle to face this threat. They do something during this house that you should never do in a horror movie. What, do you sh what should you never do in a horror movie if there's two or more people? 
split up. Yeah, never a good idea. But they do. Soski appeals off to deal with Dracula's daughter and Dracula's brides. The Bride of Frankenstein peels off to deal with the She-Wolf and Anaksu Namum. And I'm going to leave it there as far as the story. I don't want to spoil everything. Just want to give you a little tease. Um, but I do want to talk about this, the location of where this house is, because it's really cool. Stage 12 on the Universal Front Lot. Why is this cool? Well, to tell you why this is cool, it's time for a history lesson that's slightly longer than the previous slightly longer history lesson. Okay, what I want to do today, seriously, I just want to take you through the highlights of all the amazing films that have shot inside the soundstage, because this is ground zero, not only for the American horror film, but for movie making in general, because this stage was built in 1928, okay? It's one of the biggest sound stages in the world. At the time it was built, I think it was the biggest sound stage in the world. It's still to this day in the top 10. Um, but it was built specifically for this movie in 1929 when it came out. It was called Broadway. Um, that's a behind the scenes still I pulled from our archive um, showing how big that set was inside stage 12. Um, there's a weird looking contraption in the middle of that. What is that? That is the very first camera crane. The camera crane was actually invented for this movie. So right from the beginning, the soundstage was associated with film history. Um, in the 1930s, in 1930 to be exact, it was also used for another musical called The King of Jazz. Um, they built a giant piano with like five different guys playing it and a full orchestra on top. Um, and this movie today is really only famous for one thing. It's famous for the fact that Bing Crosby made his movie debut in King of Jazz in this movie when he was part of a trio, a singing trio called The Rhythm Boys. And there's Bing filming inside stage 12. Now you're going, John, what does this have to do with horror? <laughs> this is what it has to do with horror. We're gonna bring it back to horror right now. Because in 1931, stage 12 was used to build the interior of Dracula's castle. You know this scene, right? Not only is this one of the most famous movie lines in all of horror movie history, it's one of the famous movie lines in all of movie history. Children of the night, what music they make. That was uttered inside stage 12. And I brought this little treat from our archive. We still have the original set drawing in our archive. This is from 1931, this is from Dracula. This is the production designer's sketch for what that set would look like. And then in the same year, in 1931, it was used again for Frankenstein. This was Dr. Frankenstein's lab. That's where that was shot. One of the most famous scenes in movie history, not only horror movies, but all of movies, it's alive. That happened inside the soundstage. And then in 1935, it was used for The Bride of Frankenstein. Now, I always, whenever I, you know, I, I share movie history with people, I always try to convey to them like how big that set was, because I don't think you, you really get an appreciation for it. So I brought it behind the scenes still, um, the image on the right there. That's how big that set was from 1935. Um, it was also used, of course, in Bride of Frankenstein for another classic scene. When the bride is first unveiled, Frankenstein is all eager to have his friend, and he goes and puts a hand on her, and she hisses at him like a cat, and then he says the immortal line as he puts his hand on the lever, we belong dead. Pulls the switch, blows the castle to hell. That's all stage 12. So moving on into the 1950s, it was used for a famous Jimmy Stewart movie called Harvey, right? And I know at this point in the tour, you're going, what does that have to do with horror? It was used for the interior of the Harvey Mansion. Why does the Harvey Mansion have anything to do with horror? This is why. That's the same set, the exterior of the Harvey Mansion on Colonial Street, right? On the Universal back lot. Does that top of that house look familiar? Psycho. That was a stock set, stock unit set that was later, you know, used for Psycho as well. Um, that, when I first started coming to Universal, that house was there. I can remember that as a kid, because I'm so old. <laughs> uh, in 1960, Stanley Kubrick filmed Spartacus inside the soundstage. It was the Roman Senate scene from that film. And this has nothing to do with anything, but I just was going through all my, you know, I, years ago in 2000, I, I put the, you know, the video monitors on the trams and I oversaw that whole project. So I did all this research on our film industry and went through all of the archive, all of the photographs, the behind the scenes stills. And I came across this one years ago and I just thought, this is so Kubrick. He numbered all the dead people. <laughs> 
Number 265, I can see you breathing. I'm sure that's why you did that. Um, and in the 70s, Universal was famous for its disaster movies. Earthquake, the airport film series, the Hindenburg, all of the biggest scenes of that movie, those were filmed inside that South Stage. And then moving on into the 1980s, again, another musical, The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, Dolly Parton and Burt Reynolds. The Chicken Ranch set for that film was originally built inside Stage 12. It was designed to open like a dollhouse so they could film exterior scenes and interior scenes. And I know what you're thinking, what does this have to do with horror? Well, that set's still there, kids. Have you seen it? Sitting out on the back lot of Universal, we call it the Chicken Ranch. That's the same house Rob Zombie turned into the House of a Thousand Corpses. And then also in the 80s, two films that have lasted the test of time, Scarface, Say Hello to My Little Friend, filmed inside Stage 12. Back to the Future, that was the interior of Doc's house in Back to the Future. It was also used for some insured shots of the clock tower. When Doc Brown's up on top of the clock tower, they filmed all of that at Courthouse Square, but they also built just the part of the top clock tower for some insert shots inside Stage 12. So both of those movies filmed inside there. Um, Psycho 3, directed by Anthony Perkins. That was the interior of the Psycho House, the Bates Mansion, was filmed inside that soundstage. And right after this, brief little personal story, um, I started Universal in 1989 as a tour guide, right? And on my days off back then, you could call up the studio and say, hey, I'd like to shadow a production, and they'd hook you up with a production. Um, in 89, I spent the whole summer on the set of Back to the Future 2, every single chance I got watching them film that movie. But one day, I was out by the Psycho House, and I saw Anthony Perkins up on those steps, and what he was filming was the introduction for the Alfred Hitchcock show that used to be in Universal Orlando. Um, and I stood in the base motel and watched Mr. Perkins film that whole scene. Uh, I was on this set too. Uh, this is 1993. Uh, at that time we were brought on, I had left Universal after I left being a tour guide. I worked as a production assistant um, when we built that whole downstairs section of the theme park, the Starway Escalator, uh, the old special effects show. And then after that, I, the only time I ever left Universal, I was gone for five years and I was working for another company that used to do industrials which are like business meetings and they would daisy chain like a million slide projectors together because there wasn't even video projectors back then. But one day we got a call to come to a meeting at Amblin uh, to meet with Steven Spielberg's producers, Kathleen Kennedy, and uh, talk about filming a scene for Jurassic Park. So I worked on Jurassic Park for about two days. Don't look for me in the credits, I'm not in there. Uh, we consulted on the scene when it's the Mr. DNA and the whole like business plan of Jurassic Park. But in that meeting, they showed me a piece of key art of a rendering of what the Discovery Center was gonna look like and it was this exact scene. And that scene was filmed inside stage 12. Uh, I was on this set too, Casper, 1995. All of Whipstaff Manor was built inside stage 12. Um, I was on this set too, in 2000. Um, when I was doing the studio tour, I wanted a, somebody to be the host, and I went to Ron Howard and asked him if he would be gracious enough to be the host of our first you know, version of the studio tour where we had the video monitors on board the tram, and I went on that set. They built the entire town of Whoville inside stage 12. Um, and then in the early 2000s, that was Bruce Banner's underground lab for the Hulk. And then um, in 2009, I was invited back to that soundstage again to meet Sid and Marty Croft. Do you guys know Sid and Marty Croft? HR Puffin stuff? Sigma the Sea Monster? The Bugaloos? Dr. Shrinker? Bigfoot and Wild Boy? <laughs> now I've lost you. Um, I met Sid and Marty Croft on the set of this. It was the Slee Stacks uh, temple in that film. And they were asking me like, oh, you know, we're gonna just tear down this set. Is there anything you want? Is there anything you want? You know, I was doing Horror Nights by this time. Um, so I took one thing. I took that ice cream van. <laughs> Do you recognize that? That was in Clowns 3D. The reason that clown was called Sweet Licks is because it's painted right on that ice cream van. I didn't have to change it. Uh, and it later became Hollywood Harry's van. It became Larry Larva's van. And this year it's getting a complete remodel. Oh. Note, to self, note to self, this hasn't been announced. <laughs> it's getting a complete remodel for something I can't talk about. All right, moving on. <laughs> 
Uh, in 2011, The Voice came in and took over that soundstage, and they filmed, I think, 17 seasons of The Voice inside there. And now they've moved to a new soundstage, which means now you guys, for the first time ever, get to go inside that soundstage. You know, I, I practically grew up on this lot. I, like I mentioned, I started as a tour guide. All of my days off, I would always go inside sound stages and I would always think about the film history of all these great movies that filmed inside there. So just to close out this section, that's a behind the scenes still from the making of The Bride of Frankenstein. You imagine, you know, tea time. They're all English. They were all English actors. They had tea on the set every day. Or, you know, you can imagine Boris Karloff having a toasty, The Bride of Frankenstein checking her makeup in a mirror. This is all stage 12. Um, this is ground zero for the American horror movie, right? And it's tied to so much film history, so I hope you guys appreciate it when you get to go see Universal Monsters, Eternal Bloodlines, inside the world famous house stage club. How about another announcement? Let's talk about the music of the monsters, but wait a minute, has this been announced yet? Slash. Now Slash is coming back again to do his sixth score for Universal Monsters, his seventh for us at Halloween Horror Nights. Um, we, you guys, all the time, I run into fans of Halloween Horror Nights at the event, and you always, you tell me what you want. You, you're not shy about it. And the one thing that I've heard over and over and over is, when are you gonna do like an album with the music from Universal Monsters? For the first time ever, this year at Halloween Horror Nights, you'll be able to get a limited edition vinyl album um, featuring uh, selections of all of the different houses that Slash has done up until this point. Um, this is the interior sleeve, you know, the open, you open up the album, this is the inside. Features all of Crash's iconic artwork. Um, I wrote the dedication. Uh, Stacy Quinalti on our team, who works with Slash and does uh, co-writes the music, uh, arranges it, produces it. He remastered all of these tracks, especially for vinyl, so this year you will finally get that album that you've been asking me for for years and years and years. All right. Should we announce the scare zone? Yes, anywhere. Pat Quinn on our team does all of the uh, scare zones and park decor for the park. He has been pitching this idea for a scare zone to Chris and I for years. And we've never said yes. And then this year we went, let's do it. It's one of the craziest ideas I've ever heard for a scare zone, but I dig it. And what it's inspired by is luchador cinema. Do you guys know what that is? It's, it's a specific genre of horror that is specific to Mexico, really. Particularly in the 60s and 70s. They would make movies with famous wrestlers and they would pit them against monsters, like not our Frankenstein, but usually a Frankenstein. Not our Dracula, but there was always a Dracula. Not our Wolfman, but there was always a Wolfman. Not our mummy, but there was always a mummy. Um, so Pat's idea was to make monster wrestlers that are fighting monster wrestlers, okay? <laughs> so I'm gonna share with you the good monstros. The Blue Death. And what's really cool about this is working with our DEI team, um, we sourced all these costumes from, from Latin America, from the very people that make luchador wrestling costumes, um, so everything's authentic. This is uh, the Blue Death. This is his tag team partner, the Green Devil. And then there's the bad monstros. <laughs> the cave monster, who's not Frankenstein. But he kind of looks like him. The horror wolf, who's not the wolf man. But he kind of looks like him. It's in the spirit of these movies. <laughs> the water demon. 
who's not the creature of the Black Lagoon. He kind of looks like it. The Bruja, the witch. The Skeleton Man. The Night Zombie. And our still walking character, the Bat. And here's the whole cast. Uh, this is gonna be tied to our Latin American house, Monstros 2, The Nightmares of Latin America. So when you come out of this house, you go right into that particular scare zone. Um, thank you, by the way, because I owe that to you guys, too. It was you who got us doing this in the first place. Years ago, back in 2009, I think, a fan, more than one, came up to me and were like, why, why don't you do La Llorona? And I had no idea what that was, because it wasn't something I grew up with in my culture. Um, but I started researching it, and I started getting into it, and I realized, wow, this is amazing. It's so Los Angeles. It's so representative of our community in Los Angeles. And so we've really been focusing on this the last few years in particular. Uh, but really the credit is for you guys for suggesting it, so thank you. A little sneak peek. This is the sculpt for the skeleton man, and this is what his finished mask looked like. This is a partnership with Immortal Masks. Um, they might be here today, uh, but they do our silicone masks for the event, and they created some amazing masks for this one. Um, we're also creating original artwork, luchador posters in the style of that artwork from the 50s, 60s. This is just a few examples. And, you know, earlier today I signed that beautiful piece of artwork that our, our own Lucas Colshaw did from Monstros. Uh, for people that came to the Universal Products and Experience booth. Um, I also gave them all these files, and, and they were kind enough to do merchandise that is available now, I think literally right now, on Amazon. For the first time ever, you're going to be able to get merchandise inspired by these houses, this Scare Zone, our Monstros house, and other original content we've done over the years. So go to Amazon, check it out. I think members of that team are going to give you guys some postcards when you're going out if you want to check it out. So I hope you enjoyed that. All right, we're getting to the end here. What's next? Note to self. Oh, God, you're not supposed to see that. Sorry. All right, it's fan appreciation time. Um, you know how this works, right? We're going to give away two express passes to HHN and an exclusive behind the scenes tour with yours truly of a house of my choosing. <laughs> which is gonna be the closest house it takes me to get to before the next place I have to go to. <laughs> um, but we're gonna give that away. We've been doing this every year of, of Midsummer Scream, and before I do that, I wanted to give it up to the people who create, produce, run Midsummer Scream. They're an amazing group of people. They do an amazing job. Um, it's a pleasure to do this show every single year. Again, I wanna give it up to you, the fans of this event. Um, your support through the years means so much to not only myself, but all the men and women who work on Halloween Horror Nights all year long to bring it to life. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So there's always a trivia question, right? You guys ready? Yeah! Wait for it. There is no trivia question this year. I'm giving those tickets away to my family. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, there seriously is no trivia question this year because I thought about this right before I came over for this show. I thought, this show is all about the spirit of home haunts, right? And earlier today I did a panel um, called Home Haunt to Pro Haunt with a bunch of different people in our industry talking about how we started out. So I have a question for you. How many home haunters are in the audience? If you're a home hunter, keep your hand up. Okay. And do we have, and be honest, any of you that do home hunts, is one of your kids the driving creative force in what you do? Yeah, keep your hand up if it's true. Okay, pointing over here. All right, come on up. Right there where you're pointing, come on up. Yeah. 
I don't think you can actually get on stage because there's no like steps. What's your name?